Electric Adventures and this is the next episode in my Let's Make a Retro Game where we'll be working through the steps uh, you would need to do to create a game for an 8-bit computer. Um, I'm covering quite a few systems in this, starting off on the um, MSX original Spectre Video and the Sega SC3000S. They're all very similar machines and migrating across to um, other Z80 machines, the Spectrum and the Amstrad and then in the next phase of the series I'll be taking it over to the 6502 systems and um, you know going over to things such as the Commodore 64 and I may continue it on to others later but the main idea is to teach you about the, st the um, of how to break down a game and go through the steps of creating one and showing you um, you know what's involved I, I mean this is not a um, in, in any way a Z80 or a 6502 assembly course. Um, I will show um, and explain statements as we need as we go through the series, but uh, there will be a time where I will refer you to um, you know, certain books and things like that if you want to learn more. But hopefully I'll be providing all of the code uh, for each of the steps so you can look at the video, uh, look at the extra provided materials that come with each episode which are available on the website and hopefully follow on. Um, input and feedback is always welcome. So in this particular episode we need to go through a bit of the structure of an actual game itself. So breaking down a game into its various components. You have uh, when the game cartridge or, or ta tape program first starts you need to set the machine up. Um, then the game will usually go into a, um, a title or in set of intro screens before you start playing the game proper. Uh, then the player starts the game. Um, some games just have press fire button to begin, and other games might have you know select the level and the, and the number of players. And then we have the actual game loop, which is um, where we do all the animations, move the enemies, move the player and things like that. So we'll cover each of these in a bit more detail. Okay, so next is the title or intro screen that most games will have. The very first thing you'll do is load the graphics and patterns that you're going to use for this screen. I'll explain a little bit more about what these, um, you know, what I mean by graphics and patterns. So don't worry about um, the detail at the moment. Um, then you'll draw those graphics and patterns to the screen and then we'll have a bit of a loop so um, obviously you wait to see whether the um, user has um, ever pressed some buttons on the keyboard if it's a computer or maybe just press the joystick button to continue or maybe you have um, allowed the user to move the joystick up and down to change some selections or it might be that they press the button first and then what the selections they are shown appear so wait for user input the detail is is in the particular game. Um, in our particular game we'll probably have the user select from a number of starting levels for a difficulty level. Um, play music, so in any particular loop in the game we need to control, we're going to have to control everything the machine is doing. So if you have um, intro music that you would like to play in your game then you need to continue to play that music as you go around in the loop. Now don't worry about timing and things like that, we'll talk about that later. Um, and then um, after a particular time you may want to flip to another screen. So a lot of games come up with a nice colourful splash screen um, and then maybe after they've played a little bit of music it'll flip over and show the high score table. Um, and then we just go around in a loop. So after the um, user has um, started the game, so in other words select the level or whatever you want to do, um, and so the, basically the player selects one or more game modes and then we need to set some things up so uh, obviously initially usually their score is going to be zero they're going to have a certain number of lives and the stage they're going to start on uh, will obviously be the first one unless the part of our player selection um, allows people to skip forward to other stages and there might be some other variables as well but this is just keeping it simple to give you examples we then load the graphics and patterns for the actual main part of the game, uh, initialize our sound 
because we need, uh, if we're playing music in the previous section, we may want to have completely different sound and music in the game itself. Right, and next we go on to the main focus of this episode, which is the actual game loop. Um, the first part of a loop is usually get player input. Um, in our, our particular case, um, for our game, we're going to be ha using the joystick controller to move left and right, and we'll be using the fire button. So we're very simple. So this is where we determine uh, when new enemy characters, such as the meteors that are in the game that we're building, um, or you know smart bombs and things like that, uh, will appear up at the top of the screen and start their way down. So in this initialization routine, you would uh, we need a random routine based and um, base that on the level that you're on to determine whether a new enemy should appear, and then we. Um, set up the variables of where that will appear, maybe display the um, uh, set up the sprite if it's going to use a sprite um, so that that can be drawn later. So this is all just ver setting up um, parts of memory so that we've we know where that sprite's going to be, but not the actual drawing part. Now, next part of our game loop is to move all of the enemies that are currently on the screen. So the, this is based on the variables that we've set up. We might have set for each enemy, we may have an X and a Y coordinate, and we may have an X and a Y velocity as well, if they're moving in all those directions. Um, but move enemies could be a bit more complicated like that. In a maze game like Pac-Man, for each of the enemies, um, you might need to make a decision about where the enemy is going to move based on their surroundings. Our game, um, the uh, enemies are basically going to move from the top of the screen to the bottom. They may move at a slight angle though, so we will have X and Y velocity in our game, but they'll pretty much move from the top of the screen down to the bottom and they'll either hit the ground or they'll hit the player. Now next we move the player. So if in our get player input we change the position of the, um, of the player, if um, we have velocity for the player so um, I mean in our particular case we're basically going to move the player left and right um, and that'll happen at the time we do the joystick but the player's bullet I, I could have split this down to a little bit so this means the player and the player bullet will be animated in this step in our particular game so uh, after the bullet has been fired it will need to move up the screen now collision detection so this is where we um, have a routine that goes through all of the visible objects on the screen to see whether any of those objects have hit the others and take action accordingly. So with the player's bullet, has a player bullet hit a, um, a meteor and then depending on what size it is it might break into two or it might disintegrate completely. Now to disintegrate completely it's not just um, it'll put it into a state of blowing up. So you can basically have a bullet hitting a meteor but if you just make it disappear it doesn't make the game very exciting so it's actually nice to then make maybe the meteor explode um, so we need to do some animation afterwards and that's what the next step is animations do any of all of these characters do we need to animate them so if it's a meteor coming down the screen if we have a couple of images we switch between the two so that it looks like it's rolling down uh, and, and, and animating as it's coming down the screen if the meteor is currently exploding do we, we move it through a couple of different pictures so that it looks like it's blowing up. Um, and then finally we draw the changes to the screen. Now drawing changes to the screen it will depend on the particular system how we do this but it's best breaking your game up into these different things. I mean like you could get the player input and immediately you know move the um, uh, the sprite for the player at that particular step but that means with a lot of the systems you have to write to the video memory that's being displayed on the screen and you don't want to do that all of the time you only want to do that uh, when the display processor which is the thing that actually draws uh, what appears on the screen is, um, is not drawing anything otherwise um, your screen might jump or flicker so timing is important once again detail that I'll get into in a little later of an uh, episode hope you've enjoyed the next episode in this series. Um, next episode we'll be getting right into learning a bit more about Z80 code so that 
um, and we're not going to learn the whole thing, just some common instructions so I can, when I'm working you through each section of code, it's easier for you to understand. So until next time, thanks to all my subscribers, thanks for watching, and I'll catch you later. Thank you.